Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Julia Freeman. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for Voices for Racial Justice. And I co-facilitate the Women's Circle. And the Women's Circle is an amazing space. It's a space that fosters support and it's a safe space for BIPOC women who have been formerly incarcerated or have incarcerated loved ones to come together and actually talk about not only solutions to end mass incarceration, but to support themselves and one another based on all the different things that they actually go through, but also to enact change. And I'm so excited tonight. We have a group of women who have made some powerful change around giving women giving birth in prison. And so we would like to highlight them they are all women, all women who are part of the women's circle. And I would like to begin to have them introduce themselves. So I'm going to ask Autumn Mason right now if you would introduce yourself. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon or evening today. My name is Autumn Mason. I am an incarceration survivor. I, um, I also contract with the Minnesota Prison Doula Project providing services to families um, experiencing re-entry. So it is a personal passion that has been driven by my personal experience of incarceration um, about seven years ago now when I was incarcerated at Shakopee Prison. Um, so Are I'm we just a, introducing ourselves right now, Autumn, not telling our story. I'll swing oh, back around for you to tell your thank story. Thank you. Okay. Great. Great. No worries. Uh, Noelle, could you please introduce thank yourself? You. Hi, I'm Noelle Fay. I am not native to Minnesota, originally from Detroit, Michigan, um, homegrown there. And I was incarcerated in Shakopee from 2016 to 19. Um, and I'm a part of this group as well. Great. Thank you, Noelle. Natalie, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Natalie Pollard. Um, I was incarcerated in Shakopee in 2015. Um, uh, I am a domestic abuse advocate. Um, I gave birth to um, a baby incarcerated. Um, I'm also a doula in training with the Minnesota Doula Project. Um, and I, you know, I am a, just an advocate for um, a number of organizations that I am involved with. Thank you, Natalie. Jolene, please introduce yourself. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jolene Mason. I am a AMA, which actually stands for grandmother, um, of several children, um, some of which who have been impacted directly by incarceration um, by having an incarcerated parent. And I was a caregiver for approximately two years. Thank you so much. So ladies, I would like to know what brought you to the Women's Circle? What was it so important or so necessary for you to be part of the space? Noelle, can you take that please? Sure. Um, in my time incarcerated and uh, all throughout my life, I felt alone. Um, I haven't had a safe place to just be myself, to have my, uh, my opinion and or to um, feel free to express my shame or the things that I'm going through a vulnerable spot to take advice to be open to take advice if, when necessary and um, that's exactly what it provided for me or has provided for me and that's why I stay my friend actually brought me into it um, right after I was released um, pretty much um, off of papers and it's um, I was welcomed in as a person in the community and welcomed home. So that's why I'm involved with that. Thank you. Jolene, can you please tell us why the Women's Circle was so important space for you to join? Yeah, well, first of all, there's nothing like it. I haven't found anything like it until I found the Women's Circle. I was in search of a safe and trusting space where I could actually share my experiences and, with others as well as, as listen to their experiences with the hopes of coming together and basically paving a better path for those, um, for others in the future, including awesome. children. Awesome, awesome. Autumn, 
Why was the women's circles is so important for you to be part of? Well, it was a part of a healing process um, that I had been going going through after you know the entire experience, and so having that space and that um, familiarity with people who understand my experience gave me so much more inspiration to move forward. Thank you, thank you, Autumn. Natalie, same question. Um, I was invited to the women's circle um, because of the passion that I had, had to, you know, be just an advocate for, you know, um, mothers giving birth while incarcerated and how important, you know, that was to me. Keeping in connection, you know what I'm saying, with my fellow sisters. I'm not going to say inmates or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to be vulnerable and just talk, you know, about whatever, you know, uh, was on my heart and what I felt, you know, and... Um, just seeing refreshing faces and, you know, just letting, you know, the women that I was, you know, in the shack with, you know, let them know that they still are loved and cared about and stuff like that. Beautiful, thank you. So ladies, the whole purpose of tonight's podcast is basically to hear your story, to hear your journey. And so I would like to give you time to actually just, you know, speak from your heart and to actually tell your story. Autumn, would you like to go and tell your story of um, your personal experience around giving birth in prison? Sure, certainly. Um, yeah, I was incarcerated at Shackleby for prison in 2014. And then I was upon entry, I was seven and a half months pregnant. And this was my third child. So my previous um, mothering experiences, I automatically knew it would be nothing like this one but this experience has been so traumatizing in a way that it's very hard to express in words um during my 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 the birth of my child I was fortunate to be supported by the Minnesota Prison Doula Project and my personal doula however just 36 hours after delivering my baby she was taken from me and placed in the custody of my family which my mother is participating here today Jolene um and I was very fortunate but you know seeing the recurring um trauma that uh, the other women were going through and some of them not as stable or not as supported as I was so it was devastating so many children going to child protection so many families, so many women uh, disconnected from their children, not knowing their whereabouts, if they're safe or not. And it was it was really awful. Um, about 10, uh, 11, a year and a half into my um, sentence, I was then shipped to a county jail. So that posed even a bigger distance um, between me and my children. And, and not just physical, I, I, wasn't, a, I wasn't able to financially um, support talking to them as often so there was a huge further disconnect in the relationship and they suffered my kids suffered my family suffered and everyone in the situation was suffering and I knew that the system was broken the way that it was treating my family my children particularly um so yeah me me bringing a part of this has been the final one of the final steps of a healing process of this traumatic experience um but I'm, I'm very passionate about making sure that i can prevent other women and other families from experiencing this as well thank you autumn and we'll talk a little bit about that change that you made here in a minute uh natalie can you please share your personal experience my personal experience um being pregnant and incarcerated well first i July 2nd of 2015, I was arrested and I was uh, went to Ramsey County Jail. At that time, I was two months pregnant. Um, and I carried out my pregnancy in county jail, um, you know, having to uh, be locked in because I had to eat and trying to make sure that I was feeding my baby accordingly and just making sure that I was taking care of myself the best that I could. Um, I, have, I ultimately went on to uh, Shakopee and gave birth to my son. And um, he was, he went into the custody of family as well. Um, when you have a baby that you've carried for the nine months and you have to, I had to set up, prepare myself, but there is no preparation in 
knowing that you're not going to be able to take care of the baby. How is this baby going to, how are you going to feel? And when, once the baby is, is gone, um, I had to suffer through the postpartum of watching my baby be put in his bassinet and be taken back to the nursery while the correction officers, you know, walked me back to the, the, the transport vehicle to go back to Shakopee. Um, not knowing how he is, if he's crying, you know, just keeping the smell of the baby on me, you know what I'm saying? Um, it was very devastating to have to go through that. And having my doula um, at the time be very, very supportive of me was the ultimate blessing that I couldn't have been more thankful for to have her in my life um, to help me get through that time um, dealing with, you know, being empty from having a baby. And I've only spent 24 hours with him. And it was like, you know, I was in the room and I was being watched all the time when I wanted to take a shower, you know, I was being watched, you know, every little thing. I didn't have any privacy at all with my baby. When they brought me back to intake, um, I had to squat and cough mm. after, after giving birth. And I had told my doula, you know, the, the, the uh, tragedy of that and how that made me feel. And that put a fire under her as to she couldn't believe she was floored that they made me do that considering there was some COs in my room the whole entire time. And um, uh, being able to be a part of the prison doula project, being able to stay in touch with, you know, women as like Autumn Mason, you know, who had a very a positive and uh, impact on my life, you know, and I hold them dearly, you know what I'm saying? in, in, as far as what we went through being mothers um, and trying to keep that connection, you know, with our children. Um, when I had my baby, I didn't see him again until he was about three months. You know, I didn't know anything about him, what he looked like or anything like that. And it's hard trying to connect with a baby that, you know, you wanted to have and take care of so bad. And um, the Healthy Start Act was just passed yesterday. So, um, which, which ended prison birth, you know what I mean? And I was crying and stuff like that. Just so happy, you know, for the mothers that's to, to come where they don't have to deal with that no more. You know what I'm saying? And I'm very passionate and just want to insert myself anywhere that I can and be supportive, you know, of women um, who are giving, who are going to give birth and postpartum, knowing the fact of what I went through and just being able to give back. Thank you so much, Natalie. And we want to talk more about that change that just recently happened. Got to get a finger snaps for that. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, Jolene, you uh, come from a different um, aspect as one of the caregivers who a baby was handed to and you had to take that journey. Can you please uh, share your story? Sure. Um, I have a tendency to ramble on. So I did. I just jotted down some notes here. Um, you know, up until my daughter received her sentence, we weren't under the impression, well, we were under the impression that she wasn't actually going to have to serve any prison time. Um, so we hadn't really prepared uh, for that possible outcome. And at 50 years old, caring for a newborn definitely was not on my bucket list. <laughs> um, not to mention, I wasn't in the best of health at the time. Well, fast forward a little bit, and I received the unexpected but expected call uh, about a day after my daughter gave birth, which meant I had to immediately come and pick up the baby. Um, at the time, I didn't have a car, so I had to scramble around and get a ride. I mean, we were expecting her, but you just never know exactly when. And so, um, but then once I got home with this tiny little being, I realized just how unprepared I really was because unlike having a brief visit with grandma, I knew I was going to be responsible for this baby um, and her siblings um, for about the next two years. Um, I didn't even have the basic um, baby things that she was going to need. Um, and I think that was part of my um, denial of reality, of the reality that I was in. Um, I soon found out that trying to get critical resources for the baby um, was going to be a lot more difficult than I had anticipated because for one, I didn't have the actual delegation of parental authority because Autumn had to sign it. You can't do that until the baby's born. Then she had to sign it. Then you have to leave it up to the authorities at Shakopee to send it out. It was a process that I had to go through. I couldn't even take the baby to the doctor. I couldn't get help from the county without that legal document. Okay, so that kind of 
put things, stall things. Um, I also never thought twice about what I would do if this baby couldn't tolerate formula. I just assumed that she could, right? Because breast milk was definitely not an option. And unfortunately, she couldn't. So after numerous doctor's visits, um, because WIC wouldn't change her formula without a doctor's note, right? So after numerous doctor's visits, WIC finally approved a more expensive soy-based formula. But that's just not something that I considered was going to be the case. So when I finally did get some, go to the county to get some assistance, I was, I was debating between getting um, relative foster care, which you know provided more money, uh, but it also came with an open child protection case, which I didn't want. And then MFIP, which gave very little money. And it also had these strict requirements that um, came along with like, like, for instance, I had to do 30 to 35 hours of job search, you know, because if I failed to turn in these job logs, um, my quote unquote benefits would either potentially be delayed or actually cut off. Well, a whole year after adhering to these MFIP policies, I find out that I actually could have received a child only grant because I was not the custodial parent and I wouldn't have had to go through all those, you know, wow. the job search and stuff. Yes, I mean, it was, it was a mess, but that's also a reflection of the system because I had numerous, in that one year time, I had numerous different caseworkers, but none of them told me this, none of them knew this. So <laughs> I found that out on my own, but it was a whole year that I couldn't get back, right? Sick and all. Um, then finally, as my daughter mentioned, taking the kids to visit was another issue in itself. I did have a car, it wasn't really reliable. So driving from St. Paul to Shakopee um, with a newborn and two other small children was, was frightening. Um, but not to mention that if during one of the visits, the child, one of the children had to use the bathroom because there wasn't a bathroom right in the visiting area, that would end the visit abruptly. We could be there five minutes. And if the child had to use the bathroom, the visit was over. Well, as my daughter mentioned, about a year of consistently bringing the kids to visit their mom. Um, this particular uh, weekend we were going, it was gonna be Mother's Day and about literally just a couple of hours before we were supposed to go visit, my daughter called me crying and told me not to come. And I later found out that she was abruptly with no, any warning being moved from Shakopee transferred to uh, some undisclosed location. And where she would spend the next almost a year going from different outstate county jails in Minnesota, which made it completely impossible for me to visit not knowing where she was gonna be, it was just terrible. you know. And then to drive two or three hours for a 20 minute visit, it just wasn't feasible. So that in itself was traumatic because the kids, I couldn't, how do I explain that to the children? Yeah. You know, they're used to seeing their mom and then all of a sudden it's just cut off. I couldn't explain it to them because I couldn't understand it myself. And that's when I really came to understand the importance of having a support system. Because not only do, do I want my experience to, to serve as an example to, pre to prevent other people from having to go through what I went through, I, I wanna be a part of creating a system of support that so many people do not have currently. And we always talk about it takes a village. Well, I wanna be a part of creating that village because a lot of children, when I took my grandkids, so many people are like, you know, to me, it was a no brainer, but some people are like, oh, I couldn't do it, you know, or because mm -hmm. they really didn't have the resources, financial mm -hmm. resources. Me and her kids lived in a one bedroom for a year, you know, so it, there's a lot of stuff that comes along with it, you know, but the baby, I didn't give much, I won't say much thought, but I didn't realize how critical that baby needed her mom, you know, she yeah. would even look at me and try to breastfeed, you know, which mm -hmm. was not going to happen, but <laughs> it's just stuff like you don't think people don't think yeah. about the impact yeah. that it has on the child and it still impacts yeah. her to this day yes 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 you think about you no know, think about breast feeding but when the baby's yeah. gone your breasts are still filled with milk exactly as mothers, you know and yes. so that's another thing that you have to deal with and that's also right. traumatic thank you jolene yes noel you were actually a baby and you have a totally different um, experience and that journey is different. Could you please share? Yeah, um, so man, 
usually when I tell my story, I always start off with the, the fact that I was born in prison because it's so significant. Um, Cause yes, I did prison time, but it's a cycle that has been repetitive in my family's life. Um, so, uh, what, but in the stories that I have, what I do know about it is obviously stories because I was just a baby when it happened. But um, from what I was told that my mother was um, incarcerated when I was when late in her pregnancy and it was for drugs and alcohol I mean drug abuse and drugs and prostitution and a bunch of other stuff I'm sorry and um so she had a while like she got a couple of years and she ended up having me and I came early actually and the the people the guards didn't believe that she was in labor so um it took her to the very last minute it took them to the very last minute to get her to the hospital um, where I just came. She didn't have any like time for anything. So I stayed in the hospital. She left. She had to go back after two days and I stayed in the hospital for an extra day. And I was picked up by a program that's similar to something we have in Minnesota. Um, I don't know what it's called, but um, it's where you go through a church basically and you have a family that hosts you. So um, initially that's where I went when I was four days old um, to a stranger's house. Um, there, there were no like legal things in there. And um, they ended up keeping me for 13 months. Um, I went back home to my mother once she was released but she was released into the community without anything except mm. for, you know, so she had her elderly mother who my, my grandmother was in her 80s when I was born, you know, and she lived with her and then she had to take care of me. And I can't imagine from, well, I can because of what I've been through, but having that tiny child that you don't even know and um, that doesn't know you, that is a dad, because I was, for the family that I went to, I ended up adopting me years late, a couple of years later, after I went through foster care, and I'd grown attached to them. <clears throat> I bonded with them, so there was no relationship with my biological mother at all. Um, so, I ended up going back into the system because she relapsed, and once I was in the system, she couldn't get me out. Um, there were, there were times when she fought for it. I know she did. I ended up talking to her. She did fight for it. And, um, they just didn't believe her. They didn't believe in her. My adoptive mother had more power. She was a, um, she was a parole officer, probation officer, child protective service worker. She worked for the state of Michigan for over 30 years. And by that time, not 30 years, but you know, she had this power, and you've got this person who's just this drug addict slash prostitute who has nothing and no one on her side, you know? And so with mental health issues and whatever else, whatever other issues there were. So she was, she was SOL. Um, so after I was adopted, because <clears throat> I was placed in foster care, I ended up going to three different, I think two or three different foster care homes from what I remember um, and different atmospheres in each one of them. Um, I know that I was physically abused in one of them. Um, I'm working, I'm in therapy right now in EMDR to recover and to like try to process a couple of memories from foster care um, because it, it's really heavy duty. It prevents me from moving forward with some of my, my life. And it is, it's caused me to act the way that I have in the past. Um, and then I, then I went to live, sorry, from there, I went to live with my adoptive, my, my now adoptive mother. Now, I want to say that, like, I say that solemnly because our relationship wasn't good either. You know, we've got generational trauma in this adoptive family. So not only am I, this little kid is carrying this trauma from being torn away at birth from her, her family, her mother, her chemically biological mother being torn away and placed into an unknown environment and then given back to her mother, then placed in another two or three unknown environments. And then you put her in the house after that with a family who struggles with mental health disorders, with abuse and um, with significant generational trauma. So now I have two whole different like monkeys on my back to battle throughout my life. 
you know, and um, that process has been really hard. And it took me going to prison and also um, seeing the cycle of that repeat itself, even though my son wasn't born in prison, I was in prison for, um, his father was in prison for 10 years of his life and I was in prison for five years of his life, you know? So now, um, now we're battling that, you know, in that process, I don't talk to my kid. I don't have any communication with my kid. And my biological mother, unfortunately passed away while I was incarcerated at Shakopee. So I was never able to, um, sorry. As it's Mother's Day was this week. Um, my son and my family, my mother, my, that that's really sensitive for me, especially around this time. But um, I never got to tell her that I loved her. You know, I never got to tell her that I forgive, forgave her for the things that happened because it wasn't her fault. You know, she hated herself internally for a long time for the things that she did. And it wasn't her fault. And to hear that from a child, you know, it would, it would be a blessing beyond blessing to ever hear that from my son. So I can't imagine, you know? So um, the system has affected my life in numerous different ways in that, in the, in the being a child born in prison, being a baby in prison, and then having a child while you're incarcerated and being separated from your family. And the mother is the main role keeper. I mean, the main breadwinner for the child pretty much in most situations at all. So, um, yeah, that, that's just, that's just a piece of it. There's so many more, but, um, sorry about that. I hey, no, don't apologize. <clears throat> apologize. Um, Noel, you had mentioned a, something really precious about your grandmother, the few moments you were able to spend with your 80 year old grandmother, how that impacted her life. <clears throat> yeah. Um, before we were talking, um, Jillian, being a grandmother and taking on the responsibility of taking care of a child, children, when, um, you know, you don't have to, you know, and in, in our day and age, it's common for people, and especially my family, you know, I don't want that responsibility. I think you said it yourself. I would never do that, you know, and or they're incapable of doing it. And like, I applaud you for for putting them first, because having a new baby at, at, at any age is hard, you know? So I applaud you. So my grandmother, unfortunately, was in her 80s when I was born. So um, the one thing, and I, this is so, it's bittersweet, but the one thing that I remember the most, um, I only saw her two or three times and she loved me and she remembered um, as she, her health digressed and her mental health went and her memory let go, she remembered me those two or three times that she spent with me or the little bit of time that I had with her. And I know that she loved me and she wanted to, but she couldn't. So, um, you know, and for a long time, I thought that I was just unwanted by her, you know, until I had that conversation with her and she said that. And it felt so good to hear that, just to know that I was wanted by her. I keep going, you know, you, you saving babies' lives and mom and obviously your daughter and it's absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so that much. That means so much. Yes, yes. yes. So Autumn, could you share uh, some of the, 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 why it was important to really fight for the change? And we just had some recent updates, but you, can you tell us what, what was the fire in your belly to make you fight for that change? And then we're going to oh, go around yeah. and and talk about that yeah so my the fire in my belly was really to give my children an example of extreme resilience in overcoming adversity because I know at some point my daughter is going to come to fully understand her um, life story and I wanted to give her something to highlight to um, be proud of as a result of everything that, that we had to endure. And then in addition to that, also, as you know, like Natalie said, we went through some things that were so degrading, so demeaning, so um, disheartening that I can't see myself not doing anything I can do to prevent that from happening to another woman. Like these, these things, most of us were incarcerated for something that was either an accident 
or something that was related to an addiction or a means of survival. And so for us to have to suffer and then have sub, sub, uh, sub, what is it? subsequential uh, uh, traumas added to it, like it is, it, it's, 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 it's it, it, I couldn't just not do nothing. So um, I've just, the only thing I knew how to do, I got a big mouth. And I I just figured, you know, use what you got, girl. And I just been using it and praying that the Lord puts me in positions to be able to spread awareness because I too had no idea what people who are incarcerated were enduring and what they were, what they were forced to have to deal with. And, um, the ways that they were just, you know, it's, it's inhumane. You know, there's so many, so many inhumane practices that have to be abolished. They have to stop. And if we call ourselves, you know, a civilized community and civilized society to see we're the only country who punishes and imprisons at this rate, it's ridiculous. But also you think about what the children, why are the children left to um, suffer because of in, in whatever manner of, of, of criminality the parent has, you know, made. But why should the children have to suffer? And at what point are their rights even considered? So it, for me, it was, the, it was my children and the hope for all children that had my fire in my belly. And seeing that the DOC was actually cooperating and actually pushing this that really inspired me to do as much as I could. Because if they're going to give it, give a little, I can give everything I can. So that was it. Great. So Natalie, can you talk more about what was the change that happened? The change that happened was that the, it was the Healthy Start Act that was passed where uh, women will, I might need, am I out on the kind of elaborate a little bit more for me too, uh, mm-hmm. where they're not, they don't have to have they don't have to give birth in the in the like prison atmosphere anymore. Like they don't have to go to like if they go to Shakopee, um, they can give birth in the hospital, but they don't have to like give their baby away. You know what I mean? They'll be able to take care of their baby while they're still serving their time in a um, like a off off you know facility like you know area a building or maybe a, a community house, setting a community a community yeah. setting there you go um where she's she's still able to have her baby um and take care of that baby and nurse that baby if she chooses to do that um but she but she's also still able to it still counts as her time you know what i'm saying um an opportunity that i never had when i told um what that i didn't get when i told my doula you know what happened to me she was there with me when I was giving birth, how rude the correction officers were when I was giving birth, the, you know, I didn't get any privacy, you know, afterwards, just the whole setting of that, the feeling of feeling like, just like a dog give birth to her puppies. And then all of a sudden the puppies get a little older and then they, the owners start giving the puppies away. It's just like, I did all of this for nothing. Um, The fire in my belly was that I didn't want what happened to me to happen to another woman. It doesn't matter what she did or what she went to prison for. It's a simple fact that being able to have comfort, being able to have that privacy, being able to you know, bond with the baby and cry and whatever else that mother is feeling and, and not have to be hawked, you know what I mean? Watched over and stuff like that. Um, like the way that I was, you know, being able to go to prenatal appointments and not be, Uh, embarrassed or humiliated or Mm -hmm. going into labor and going to the hospital with correction officers, you know, pushing your wheelchair and women grabbing their little kids and pulling them closer to them and stuff like that. And it's very humiliating. And then the experience of coming back to the facility and going through the intake and stuff like that. I just did not want that to happen to any other woman like it happened to me. I'm talking about the worst feeling, you know, that I could ever feel in my life. And giving birth is a, is a precious experience. It's a precious moment that, a, you know, a woman wants to remember. And I remembered, you know, mine in a messed up way. And yeah. 
talking to my doula was like, damn, is there anything that can be done as far as this stopping where women don't have to go through this, you know, giving birth and just leaving their baby and something else that was also essential is breastfeeding. I mean, some women Mm -hmm. choose to do that and choose not to. All of my other five children were breastfed. The one child that I, you know, I gave birth to, he has been the sickliest child out of all of my other kids because he never received any milk from me. Mm-hmm. Um, how essential that is, how important that is, you know, even if it's just, even if, if it's just colostrum or just a mm-hmm. little bit, you know what I'm saying, to give to that baby to help build their immune system up. I didn't, I didn't have that. My child is sick all the time, mm-hmm. my five-year-old. Um, so I wanted to feel, I wanted to, I don't know, get in somewhere where I could, you know, put my energy in wherever I could get it in and fit it in um, to, I guess, advocate or just talk about anybody who would listen, like this has, this has to stop. This is not right. You know, women, you know, have their baby and they bond with their unborn baby and stuff like that. And then it's like, well, what are you, what, what am I going to do with the baby? Um, you know, after I have them, because at the, at one point, I didn't know what I was going to, when I was in Ramsey County, I didn't know what I was going to do with my son, and like Noel said, there were like family, it was like a program through church where, you know, people would come, and they would take your baby, and, and like take care of the baby for you until you got out, I mean, I was thinking like that option, I was thinking of like adoption, seriously, I didn't know what I was going to do with this newborn, and my parents, at the time, they were already elderly, you know, taking a, taking care of my other children. So trying not to put it extra more stress on them, you know what I'm saying? So it was essential that this Healthy Start Act was passed in order to, you know, let these mothers be with their baby, have their baby, have that comfortability um, in, a, in more of an easygoing, you know, uh, setting where they're not, they don't feel like, you know, they're they're in jail, you know, they're in yes. prison. And um, it's Thank a blessing. You. Yep, it's a blessing that that was passed. That's beautiful. So Jolene, tell me this. So if you had the CARE Act, right? And you would still have to take, you know, your granddaughter, right? But t- was, great, was it a boy or girl? It was a girl. Girl. Right? Girl, okay. You would still have to take your 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 you had the boy Natalie. Okay, I was getting them mixed up. So you would have to take your granddaughter, but what of difference would it have made as a caregiver for her to actually be with her mom for that that time? Would you uh, would have had time to get ready? Oh, that that <laughs> yes, absolutely that. Uh-huh. But I mean she she I just I can't express how if I didn't know it before. I know it now, the importance of that, that mother child bonding, you know, in the early stages, you know, because the daughter that I, I, the child that I helped raise um, as a grandparent, I would have done that anyway, but in trying to fill the shoes of a, of a parent, it's, it's, it's impossible, you know, but she's had questions, you know, and, you know, about initially before when her mom first got out, she had questions, you know, and, and the child should never be put in a place when a where they don't know where they come from in the sense that they're birthing, you know, kids understand all that. And so I think the CARE Act, it, 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 it helps with the child's social and emotional development as well. Even in the, if even if it's just that first year that the mother can spend with that baby, that is a critical time for that child. And I'm so, I'll be honest, I was skeptical that, that this bill would pass because I know you know, how people look at, at people that are, are incarcerated, you know, it, it, the system is just barbaric and inhumane. And then they look at people, especially women in that light. So I'm so, when I, I got the news that it passed, I'm like, finally, they're seeing that we're talking about people, human yes. beings, the mm-hmm. mothers, the babies, and the needs of the child and how critical that first start is for that baby. Thank you. Thank you, Jolene. So Noel, what are your thoughts around this CARE Act? What, when, when you heard that it passed, what were your thoughts? Um, my main, my, like my main forethought, the things that I, it goes to is not about myself. It's about the women that I met and connected with, um, while I was incarcerated, man. Um, I, I had the, I, 
I had the blessing, the privilege to be an ABE tutor. And so I had, I had to personally interact with a lot of women and there were women without GEDs who were pregnant and they were fighting for their, you know, just to get their self together. And they were so put down and just discouraged and worried about their babies and where they were going. And so to hear this and to think about some of the women that um, I may know that might go in in the future or, you know, whatever the situation may be, it won't be what it was before. And I won't have to ever see, and no, no woman hopefully won't be seven months pregnant with handcuffs on, yeah. you know? Um, and walking to SEG, <laughs> you know, some things like that, that, that should never happen. It's not normal in a normal world, like normal life. People don't go through things like that. It's traumatizing. And I'm so grateful to be able to watch that and see that process. As far as my own, um, it, I believe that this is important because, um, the relationship that a child has as a baby from the day it's born, if it's not nurtured, um, that bond is not nurtured, then it, like I developed a hole that I've been trying to fill. You know, I've always wanted the bond that comes with having a mother. You know, I, I've never felt bonded to either mm -hmm. one of my mothers. You know, I never felt like I had a mother to, to hug and hold the same way. You know, and I've been told repeatedly about that too, in no uncertain terms by various people, including some of my own family. You'll mm -hmm. never know what it's like. Mm -hmm. You'll never know what it's like to have a mother. You know, so um, those things, they sit with you as a child and um, in your development, you're supposed to, at a certain age, you're supposed to meet these things. It's in Eric Erickson's, um, um, his, model theory of how things grow, of how children develop. I didn't get any of that. My mental health was so messed up by the time I was five years old. Most of it, I blacked out. You know, I had no social skills, no communication skills, no boundaries, um, no positive interactions with men, no, um, no nothing. And on top of it, no relationship with my mother, not my adopted mother the way that I want it to be and not my biological mother at all, which I missed out on my culture and my life. Because not only am I um, black and white, but I'm native as well. Mm -hmm. So there are things that I just don't get and um, it, it created um, a, an identity crisis in me that I struggled to reconcile and I still struggle to reconcile. You know, so where do I belong? You know, what does family really look like? I've always watched other people's families and been, and been envious and jealous and hateful and resentful and bitter because they had something that I would never experience. And then I wanna give that to my kid, but I have all of these things swirling around in my mind, all of these monkeys on my back. Mm -hmm. So I can't do that. So then the cycle continues. So as this is important, this on a personal level, that's the story I have to offer you, but that's mm -hmm. why it's so important because I can't imagine what my son's gonna say when he's ready to talk about it, you know, or anyone else who has to, any other child who has to go through this when they're ready to talk about it. I've heard stories and it's not okay. You're right. It's not okay. So um, that being said, you all have already expressed what strong advocates you are for this change for how women give birth in prison. But what are some next steps? You know, what else, you know, you might be trying to accomplish or how else can people get involved? What do you want the people to know? So Autumn. What I would like the people to know, first and foremost, is that, yes, we are still celebrating the passing of this bill and to end prison bursts in Minnesota. Um, but also, I would like people to have a newfound... Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. I would like to change the mindset on how people view um, incarceration, particularly female incarceration. I would like to change the system and or change the mindset so that we can change the system so that we can enable and support these families and reduce recidivism rather than cause further harm. So I'm just kind of working on starting to um, 
a new way of, of thinking. And, and I think that this bill is going to push a lot. And it shows that a lot of people are more open to the idea of what's really going on and how we can change that to have a more positive impact on our community and our community members. Thank you, Autumn. Mm-hmm. Natalie, any, any last words? What do, what do you want the people to know? Anything you want to share, the whole nine yards? I just want the people to know, you know, how important it is, you know, to, for family, you know, as well to, um, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, of course, you know, to be there and be supportive as possible, you know, to a loved one um, who is incarcerated as, you know, as a woman, um, if she's pregnant and going to give birth to just come together and uh, help this mother and this baby, you know, if they care and love them. Also, um, you know, that I know this, this act has passed. I also didn't, I, I didn't want to exclude men who are like non-violent offenders to also be able to have, uh, you know, visitation, you know what I'm saying, to get, get involved with babies as well. And not just, uh, oh, it's all about the mothers. No, because there's men out there too that, are, that were formerly incarcerated who care and love their children and want to be involved as well. So, having to bring them in at some point and and incorporate them into uh, the movement. Um, And you're on the men's side, you know, getting fathers involved. And I just wanted to just, again, say thank you for allowing me, you know, to be a part of, you know, everything that's going on and just, you know, being asked to talk and speak. You know, I got time for this. Everything that I do, I put aside to make time for what I love to talk about and what I'm passionate about the most. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. So, Noelle, what are some thoughts? What do you want to leave the people with tonight? Um, so I always try to br- bring a different flavor and a different perspective. I'm more of a storyteller than anything else. And um, the, so the main thing that my next step and, and what is new in my life is um, I'm writing a book. So oh, nice. um, I've, it's not like... It, it's not a passive thing. Um, I've been commissioned to write a book about myself. So with that, I don't even like saying it. It's so weird. It's um, so writing my story, my personal story, and I'm going to do it in snippets. You know, it, like my blog, everything is small stories. And um, when it comes to when it comes to my experience with um, incarceration and being born in prison, as well as that whole process of mental health, that is where I, I'm centered, but that will be included in that um, because it's so important that personal yeah. story, we are people, we're individual people. Mm-hmm. Natalie doesn't just have kids. Each one of her children is an individual little person who has all of the same complexities and intricacies in their little brains and their hearts as us. Mm -hmm. and they deserve the utmost respect and best treatment possible so um and and they're gifts you know children are gifts so yeah so that's that's what i have to offer and i just want to keep reminding people you know we see numbers we see black and white we see a bill Mm -hmm. a bill was passed no Mm -hmm. it's not just a bill was passed what did you say natalie they will never have to be born in prison again. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's Yay. beautiful. That is beautiful. Yay. That is beautiful. So, Thank you, Noel, yeah. for reminding us. Yay. Those bills are connected to living, breathing people. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yay. Jolene, I'm going to give you the floor. What do you want the people well, to know? I think these young ladies, these young women have, have articulated exactly what I, I would have said. Um, and I just wanna just make sure that, you know, like you said, this bill is attached to real life. So I just wanna make sure that the way this rolls out sets up the foundation for the lives to come after that are gonna be impacted. This bill will also, this act will also give families that time that they need so they're not in such a rush state to, to make sure they have in place the things that their children need if they have to go into incarceration beyond that first year. We just have to make sure that we sit down and lay a strong foundation for our babies. And, and, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be a, a part, play a role in making sure that happens. It's beautiful. So we know that the bill is passed, but we know sometimes there's the breakdown in actually <laughs> implementing 
the, 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 the bill. And that's where we need people, to, you know, to, uh, to watch the really? store. We have people here yeah. who are on this call tonight who will be watching yeah. how this bill is implemented to make sure that the change is the change that we seek. Exactly. Uh, we invite you to do the same, to make sure that if it's not, you call your legislators and remind yep. them you passed this bill and this is where it's breaking down. Oh, this is what it's not doing, but you can also call them and praise them and say, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This is great. This is the kind of things we need. And here's some more ideas. So exactly. this is just the beginning. Totally, totally, totally love all of you all that's here. Yes. We appreciate you women. See you uh, in a couple of weeks for a circle. Yes. And thank you for joining us. All yes. of you all. Thank Have a you. Good day. Thank Bye. you. Love Bye. you guys. Love you. Bye-bye. Love Bye. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.